Welcome to this week's online worship service at NBC. We're so glad you're with us today. As we begin, we just want to let you know about two exciting things that are starting today, Sunday, April 11th. First, we want to let you know that in-person Sunday school classes resume starting today at 9.45 a.m. We have classes available for children and adults of all ages, and we invite you to come out and be part of that. Again, that will be every Sunday at 9.45 a.m. Also, we are starting a brand new men's Bible study this evening at 7 p.m. It's called Be a Godly Man, and that will take place here in the sanctuary at NBC. You can see the dates and times for that study on your screen right now. And again, men, we invite you to please come out and be part of this great study. Well, today we'll be hearing Pastor Gershmeyer's Easter sermon called, Who is Jesus to You? So we pray that you are blessed and encouraged by that. Let's pray and we'll get started with today's service. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this day. And we pray, Lord, that as we worship you, whether in person in the sanctuary or online where we are in our homes, God, that, that you would help us to focus on truly hearing from you today and help us to block out any distractions that would keep us from worshiping you. Lord, as we sing, as we hear from your word, and as we pray, Lord, help us to honor and glorify you through all of those things today. And Lord, we pray as we hear this Easter message that you would help us to remember to be thankful for for the resurrection of Jesus Christ every single day. Lord, we pray again that you would just bless this time together, and we thank you for all of this in your name. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought, and the storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. Of Christ, I live. There in the ground, his body lay. Light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth a glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost his grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood. Home 
here in the power of Christ, I'll stay. In Christ Alone is a favorite hymn of mine. And part of the reason that it's a favorite is because shortly after Keith wrote that hymn, I had the privilege of hearing him and his wife at the annual meeting of the Baptist Convention in Maryland, Delaware. And it was such a privilege. Keith and Kristen have written over 300 hymns. Um, and uh, that one is certainly as my favorite and certainly stands out as that as we sing about the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Keith really answers the question, who is Jesus? And we want to do that this morning. As we look, if you want to turn your Bibles or follow your Bible outline, for Philippians 2, 5 through 11. So who is Jesus? In fact, he asked the question of his disciples in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 16. He said, what are people saying about me? Who is it that people are describing me as? And so they gladly answered him and said, some are saying, that you're John the Baptist, resurrected, or that you are Elijah, one of the prophets, or Jeremiah, or some of the other prophets. So what are people saying about who Jesus is? What do you hear about who Jesus is? Some people believe he's a myth, that he was made up by the disciples, by the early church, Others believe that he was a fabrication of the early church. Jesus describes himself as the son of man, referring back to Daniel chapter seven and eight. Others would say he is Messiah of Israel. Some skeptics would say he was a deluded religious leader or a man like any other. Some would say he was a wise man. Others, the ultimate revolutionary, or a teacher, or rabbi, a prophet, the son of God, as the Roman centurion called him when he witnessed Jesus' death. Others would admit that he was a good man. My uncle Forney was a good man. He was a retired lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Air Force, and he was dearly loved by friend and family. He and his family were in Salt Lake City, Utah. He had retired from the Air Force there, and he had flown out on assignment. He was still working there at the air base, and he flew out on assignment to New Jersey. And after he completed his assignment, he was flying back from New Jersey. And as the plane came in, in fact, uh, those who witnessed it said the plane came in like that. It missed the runway by 300 yards. And as you can imagine, it was a fiery ball of flame when it came to a standstill there on the runway at the Salt Lake City Airport. 89 people were aboard that flight. 43 of them died. My uncle Forney was one of them. It was a sad, sad day when we buried him at the National Cemetery in Arlington, Virginia. I still remember the 21 gun, gun salute. This was 1965. <clears throat> and um, all of the other pageantry that went along with the burial of a military officer. His family was devastated by his death, as you can imagine. Two daughters, Dolores and Lee, 
and a young six-year-old son, Ricky. I still call him Ricky. He likes Richard, <clears throat> but I call him Ricky. And um, it was um, a terrible experience. Uncle Forney was a good man, but he was just a man, just a man. So Jesus then followed up with another question to his disciples. He said, who do you say that I am? It's not enough to say I believe in Jesus, whether it be any one of these things that I listed. It's not enough to say you believe. Who do you believe in? Notice these verses in verses 5 through 11. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So who is Jesus? You remember what Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. That was Jesus, or Peter's response to Jesus' question. So I want us to look at four things that we discover in these verses that describe who Jesus is. First of all, in verse 6 and the first part of verse 7, Jesus is the eternal one. The eternal one. Now, other translations might say being in the form of God. Jesus possessed the specific character of God. He was 100 percent God. He was truly equal to the father. He didn't assert his rights, though. He came to earth willingly, gladly, without hesitation. In John 8, 58, Jesus said to the Pharisees, before Abraham existed, I am. And that certainly sent a very clear message to them who Jesus said he was. Notice in John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And then John 1.18, I'm reading here from the Amplified Bible. No one has seen God, his essence, his divine nature at any time. The one and only begotten God, that is the unique Son, who is in the intimate presence of the Father. He has explained him and interpreted and revealed the awesome wonder of the Father. If you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. That's what this verse is saying. Now, what will my response be as I understand that Jesus is the eternal one? He is the eternal God. My response is that I will acknowledge that Jesus is God. Jesus didn't start in a stable. He wasn't born in a stable as if that were his first existence. Jesus has always been God. Would you acknowledge that now? Even as you sit there in that pew, would you acknowledge that Jesus is the eternal one. Now, secondly, notice in the second part of verse 7 and in the first part of verse 8, 
Jesus is the incarnated one. What do we mean by incarnated? Well, notice John 1:14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Now, back to the words of Paul, Jesus made himself nothing. He emptied himself. He became a nobody. He took the very nature of a servant, a humble slave. <clears throat> he was in human likeness, merely a person. Now, we could say, there goes the Son of God. But when people saw him, during the first century, they didn't say there goes the son of God. They merely said Jesus was a man. Now, Jesus was a very common name in first century Judea. A lot of people had the name of Jesus, as a lot of people had the name Mary. You notice all the Marys that are mentioned in the Gospels. But in fact, not only was Jesus a man. He was the son of man, the Messiah. He was also the son of God. Now, how was Jesus like us? What did that look like? First of all, he was born like us. He came into the world like billions of others. He was 100% man while being 100% God. He grew like us, and Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. That's Luke 2.52. Can you imagine what it would be like to go to school with Jesus? <laughs> that would be interesting, wouldn't it? Not only did he grow like us, he was tempted like us. He experienced the same pressures, desires, needs and drives like us to lie, to cheat, to steal, but he never gave in. He can relate to us because of those temptations. Finally, he suffered like us. He got tired. He got fatigued. He grieved. He cried. He felt pain. He was human. You remember on the night Jesus was betrayed and arrested. After the Lord's Supper, he went into the Garden of Gethsemane. He took Peter, James, and John with them, and he told them to watch and pray while he went a little distance further to pray. And he said, the sorrow is so great, it almost crushes me. And he said, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. What cup was he talking about? He was talking about the cup of crucifixion, which was about to happen to him in just a few short hours. Jesus became what you and I are so we can become what he is. Now, in the second part of verse 8, we discover that Jesus is the crucified one. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, you and I can't fathom that idea of death on a cross. It was cruel. It was barbaric. It was reserved for the worst criminals. Listen to these prophetic words in Deuteronomy 21, 23. If a man is guilty of a capital offense, is put to death and his body is hung on a tree, you must not leave his body on the tree overnight. Be sure to bury him that same day because anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. Can you imagine 
God the Son was under God the Father's curse while he hung on that tree. Imagine in the empire of Rome in the first century, walking out your front door, walking down the street and seeing a parade of crosses with men nailed and or tied to them. What an awful sobering sight that must have been. And yet that's what happened to Jesus. Why? Why did he do it? You know, he said he wasn't hung on that cross unwillingly, but willingly. Why did he do it? In 1927, in West Africa, a young man by the name of Asibi, A-S-I-B-I, contracted yellow fever. Yellow fever was a death sentence back then, but unlike almost everybody else, Asibi survived. He had developed antibodies in his blood system. The doctors decided to extract his blood, and out of his blood they developed a vaccine. One man's blood saved millions of people. <clears throat> well, that's what Jesus' blood does. Jesus' blood is the perfect vaccine for the disease called sin. And remember what sin is. That middle letter, I'm in charge of my life and I don't need God. That's the attitude that leads us to those specific sins that we commit. Jesus' blood became the vaccine to heal us from that sin. Look at 1 Peter 2.24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. And then notice 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son purifies or cleanses us from all our sin. So what is my response? My response is believe that he died for my sins. Notice how personal it gets. Not the sins of the world. My sins. You've heard the old saying, if there wasn't anybody else to die for, Jesus would have died for me. That's how personal it becomes. Jesus was a person who died for individuals. You remember that Jesus was placed in the middle of two thieves who had committed crimes horrific enough to be crucified with him. One of the thieves railed against Jesus, but the other told him to stop it, that he didn't deserve the death that they deserved. And you remember Jesus' response, you will be with me today in paradise. So that thief believed that Jesus died for his sins. Now, fourthly, Jesus is the exalted one. He is the exalted one. Let me read again verses 9 through 11. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. He is the exalted one. This is the final stage of Jesus' career. He returned to heaven in triumph. He left heaven 
as the Son of God. He returned to heaven as the Son of God and the Son of Man. Notice Acts 2, verses 32 and 33. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Peter was preaching this sermon on the day of Pentecost before thousands of people. The day of Pentecost was a Jewish celebration where Jews from all over the world, the dispersed Jews, would come back to Jerusalem to celebrate this day. So they heard the gospel from Peter. And you know how they heard it? All of the 120 disciples were speaking all of the languages that were present that day. So these people were hearing the gospel in their own language. That was the baptism of the Holy Spirit that came upon the disciples and enabled them to speak languages that they probably didn't even understand, but they spoke it. And the book of Acts tells us that over 3,000 people came to faith in Christ that very first day of the church. Now notice 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me as to one abnormally born. Now, we learned this morning at the sunrise service that there was someone who was the first eyewitness to the resurrection. Anybody remember who that was? Mary who? Mary Magdalene. The woman who heard and saw Jesus and became the first eyewitness. Now, there will always be people who say Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Nevertheless, the resurrection is an historical fact vouched for by over 500 people who were eyewitnesses to his resurrection. Don't be discouraged by those who deny the resurrection. Be filled with hope that one day we will see the proof as he returns. Now notice Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What it, does it mean to be a Christian? Simply said, Jesus is Lord. That's what it means to be a, a Christian. I acknowledge that he is God. I believe that he died for my sins. And I commit all of my life to Jesus Christ, my Lord. So my response is commit all of my life to Jesus Christ, my Lord. You know, Jesus will have the last word. You confess him now with joy or you confess him later in shame. What about you this morning? Are you a Christian? Are you proclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord, not only by your words, but by your deeds? As the Holy Spirit empowers you, as you have given your life to Christ, empowers you to live the life that Jesus died to give you to live.